Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Lockdown Lessons, part 54 now. With me today, I've got Matt Longley from Mobster. So I just wanted to say a big hello to you firstly, Matt. Hi, Phil. Thanks for having me today. No problem at all. Good to see you again. So um, this is called Lockdown Lessons for a reason. The reason I ask these questions that I'm about to ask you is really I just want to find out about your experiences during lockdown, what's happened in the wonderful world of Mobster, um, your wins and challenges, really. So I suppose the first question is, if you can rewind time back to sort of March or even February 2020, um, there were some obviously quite concerning news coming from the Far East and Italy and places like that. At what point did you think this might actually be a problem for you commercially, Matt? Um, I think commercially we didn't really think about, um, about the impact until March time, 2020. Um, internally, I was, I was quite um, aware of the news and, and, and was trying to get us all set up for home working um, to the point where one of our founders actually um, questioned my sanity and was a bit worried about me, uh, <laughs> thinking I was a bit of a conspiracy theorist. But I just wanted to make sure that we were set up to make sure that we all had our laptop chargers with us every day and weren't leaving computers at work and, and had space at home and chairs and that sort of thing. Um, and did a sort of uh, bit of a disaster planning, I guess, um, internally, so that when lockdown did come, we were, I feel like we were prepared at least internally to deal with it. Um, so, but, but from a commercial point of view, didn't really um, know what sort of impact it was gonna have until that lockdown started and that, that first week hit. <laughs> As it did with most people actually, it's surprising. I would say about 10% of the people I speak to, um, it didn't, lockdown didn't really make any impact upon their business at all, but the vast majority it did. And even the 10% struggled with, you know, they might not have struggled to win business or retain business, but they struggled in other areas. Um, yeah. So, so everyone, I think, had issues with it. So, so obviously, we were in the position, you got your home working sorted out, um, you, you were a bit, you were probably better equipped than most people going into lockdown. Um, but what were your sort of main sort of uh, challenges, I suppose, when lockdowns did sort of kick in commercially? I think, um, so with media, we, we we do a lot of um we look at audiences we look at um location data to understand how people how people move around not individuals but how how groups move around um and uh the 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 biggest challenge for us really was thinking about um how were we going to talk about people moving around when everyone was at home um and the the instinct from a lot of the agencies we work with and and, and the clients we work with was you know, there's, there's really no need for us to look at location data while everyone's, while everyone's at home. Um, so we had to very quickly pull our heads together and, and, and figure out what, what we could offer people um, during that, that initial lockdown. Um, and uh, uh, where, we, where we looked at at first really was the, the insight. What we have access to is a lot of insights um into into what people are doing and what people have been doing and what we were saying was there's nothing differentiating people if they're all at home if everyone's at home everyone's on the same level so how do you identify people and how do you target people um and what we decided to do was look at um uh, app behavior on on people's phones um, before and during the lockdown so we were saying actually while people are at home we know where the you know five or six million people here were going to cinema once a month. We know where they are broadly in the country, where they over index. Um, and we know what they're now looking at, um, what sort of categories of apps they're looking at on their phones now. Um, so we were able to find some really interesting insights that we would never have, never have assumed, I suppose, for, um, for any clients. And that was, that sort of led to a, a quite interesting two or three months of, of going to clients and trying to tell them stuff that they weren't really aware of. And that, and that, that helped us find a, a new direction, I suppose, at the start of lockdown. That's brilliant. Just re, it just re, re, sort of reminds me of that expression, sort of necessity being the mother of invention. And uh, so from what I understand from what you're saying, you absolutely wouldn't have done that if we hadn't been forced into lockdown. No, no, I think I was, I'd been looking for ways to, um, to engage with clients, but I think media is so, um, it's so built on face-to-face -face relationships and, um, you know, having a lunch meeting and, and, and talking about work and, um, 
some client entertainment as well and, and, and having a pint with somebody and, and suddenly you don't have that and you feel a bit lost. And I was trying to work out a way to, to, to engage with people beyond just the going out and having a drink with them and, and taking them for lunch because it, 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 it was getting to the stage where it felt like if you didn't do that, you didn't have the right to speak to somebody, which is not the way I really wanted to work. So actually for us, it was a really good opportunity because it meant that we got to spend time with people from agencies, if not face-to-face, -face, but face-to-face -face on Zoom, um, purely talking about work. And you have an automatically common thing in that you're both at home. Um, so you've got, you know, some people have got kids at home, and, and a lot of us at work did as well. So you have some commonalities and, and common issues there, um, which you can sort of have a, have a five minute chat about, but then you got talking about the work. And I'd say that in the three months, the first three months of lockdown, we had more conversations bespoke to specific clients um, about their issues than we've ever had, ever had before. Um, and rather than sending out the insights we found just en masse to everybody we knew, we were taking the insights. And if there were, I don't know, 500 data points, we'd find the five that were relevant for each, each specific client. We'd work up a whole, a whole um, insight report for them and send them out directly to them. So we did, we were doing about sort of 80 to 90 bespoke insight reports a day, um, which with a sales team of seven at the time was quite difficult, <laughs> but we, we didn't need to furlough anybody um, on the sales team. Um, and we just did a lot of proactive work and, and we didn't ask for anything back for the insights. We didn't charge for it. We knew we weren't going to get bookings in for the, the initial time. Everything sort of dropped off a cliff, but we, we kind of just felt that if we just focus on delivering insights and giving agencies what their clients need now, that hopefully when the, when the budget started returning after the, after the lockdowns or, as things receded um, from a COVID perspective, that it would start to come back to us. And it proved from that summer onwards that that, that was the case. It was a really hairy three months, but we just had to stick with it and, and knew that the quality of conversations we were having, having with people was unlike anything we'd had before. And that kind of gave us um, the heart to kind of carry on and, and, and keep pushing. That's brilliant. So, so from what I'm hearing, then you, it's it's the value you you were adding when you pretty much knew in your heart that no one was really going to be spending. That actually helped you benefit coming out of those that sort of three month period, right? I think so. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you've got the clients would we're looking at their agency, their media agency is going. We haven't got any money. We can't spend at the moment. What can you tell me in this downtime? I guess about our audience um, and the agencies were going. Ah, <laughs> we, we have a, a retainer with the, with, the, with the client. We have to do work for them. We haven't really got a huge amount to tell them and they were relying on media owners on our side to, to give them insights. So I think giving them insight reports that they could just pick up, rebrand and give to the client really, really helped, um, helped a lot of agencies and just helped show that we were kind of there to, to support them when they needed it. Um, and yeah, it, it works. It was it was the right thing to do. Absolutely. I've, I've seen a few a few businesses do that. You know that they're not necessarily going to make any money in the short term, but but invest for the long term, knowing that this thing is going to be temporary, even though at the time we didn't know how temporary it was going to be. So it was a yeah. it is a, it's, it's a big leap of faith. I think you took there and quite a few other companies did, but it certainly paid off then. So so talk to me about the wins that you've had since March 2020 then, Matt. Um, so I think from the 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 wins we had were certain clients that we'd been pushing to to get bigger bigger campaigns signed off with um and it was the ones that were sort of ready to go big as soon as lockdowns ended or as soon as restrictions started, started being lifted so um fast food kfc became one of our biggest spenders because they were one of the first to sort of go out and tell people where they're where they were doing takeaway services, you know, or socially distant takeaway or deliveries, um, and um, and travel companies as well. Uh, you think that no one was travelling, and obviously all travel companies pulled all their budget. But as soon as that summer happened and people were able to travel around the UK, you had a lot of brands suddenly wanting to um, to get people to go to certain places in the UK and 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 not others. And um, I think the um, the the government campaigns spent 
um, well with us in terms of informing people about the um, the requirements around COVID, but also in terms of travel, um, a lot of the individual um, tourist offices around the country um, have spent quite a bit on campaigns to uh, to get people to come to their area of the country rather than rather than others. So there were some pockets that we never really got spent from before that we were able to open, um, which is really helpful for us. At the, the up to that point, we'd had growth of around two to five percent year on year for three years, um, but that July that year, twenty twenty, was our um, biggest ever month, and then the Q three that year was our biggest ever quarter. Q four was our biggest ever quarter, and we managed to finish flat for the year on which we were so happy with, <laughs> um, and it was a really big relief. So we didn't have to let anyone go. We didn't have to. Um, Given anyone sort of long term pay cuts or anything like that, it was um, it was a really good thing to get through the year and 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 know that we'd consolidated what we'd done before, um, which then sets us up for twenty twenty one, which was um, uh, about seventy percent up year on year, it became our biggest ever year by a long long way, um, but it all came down to that three months between March June twenty twenty, um, where we just didn't know if it was going to lead to anything, um, and it could have. Could have gone terribly. <laughs> we could not be here yeah. to tell us all now, but luckily you made it worked. calculated decision and it's it's paid off, which is brilliant. So yeah, okay. Then so so essentially um those three months ended um and then you you've basically played catch up and you've managed to uh, finish the year on an even kill, which is which is amazing then. So so what are your plans for the future then, Matt? <clears throat> um so I think the the growth we had last year has enabled us to um build the team significantly. So um, by the end of February, over half of our employees would have been here less than a year. Um, so we, we almost doubled in size in the last two years. Um, and the plan is to continue that growth over the next next five years really now. And, and I think it's allowed us to come out of um, a period of two or three years of, of, of sort of slow slow growth and being quite comfortable to actually look at how we become a, a hyper growth business and 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 really push on um we've identified lots of different areas that we're going to focus on for the next 12 to 18 months um in terms of um widening what we do throughout europe um not from opening offices but working with agencies here that, that buy campaigns in europe um looking at what we can do specifically um, for the government around making um, specific audience packages for them. Um, but we've also developed, um, we've invested quite heavily over the last 12 months in a, a new data platform, which visualizes um, that movement data I talked about. So people can start seeing um, when they brief us, we can then take them through um, pockets of the country that they wouldn't ordinarily target um, and, and, and start looking I think to, to see it, it helps you, you know, we're humans and we like visuals. And I think seeing something helps you really understand where where people are and, and, and how, how to target better. But the, the biggest outcome of all of this really is that it gave us the time to, through talking to, to more agencies about, um, about what they do, it gave us time to really, really look into the way we do business um, the impact we have on our local community and a few clients started talking about um, emissions and sustainability and that took us on a whole different tangent over the last nine months now um, and I'll cut a long story short because I can talk forever now about sustainability I've become like a bit of a geek <laughs> about um, different scope one two and three emissions um, but um, we've spent nine months doing a lot of research and speaking to some um, sustainability consultants to understand the emissions of what we do, not just from a company point of view in terms of what our commuting emissions are in our office, you know, the gas and the electric from being in this, this building, um, but looking at what we do and, 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 you know, what we do is put adverts on, on phones and um, the, the consensus was that the emissions for a campaign were the um, was the energy intensity of a phone. So we, we looked at that and said, well, actually, we've got to look, think about how the ad gets from a data center to the phone in the first place. 
And what we found out was that only 15% of the emissions are related to the actual end user device. 5% um, is the data center, but 80% is a transfer between the two of them. Um, so now we're in a bit of a mission to share that data with anyone that will listen um, and to, um, to help clients buy um, more efficient mission, efficient campaigns based on, on emissions. Um, so we can help people through our targeting by buying fewer ads, but more targeted ads. Um, we can help them look at um, the ads they're actually building and build more um, energy efficient ads. Um, so you can reduce your campaign emissions by around 80% just by doing those two things. And then we help them, um, we then invest in um, gold standard projects directly um, to buy carbon credits on behalf of those clients to make sure that their campaigns are climate positive. So if a campaign um, uses 500 kilograms of, of carbon um, just by existing, then um, we will buy a ton so that we are, that, that the campaign has taken out 500 kilograms of future emissions beyond what the actual cost of the campaign is. So that that's sort of changed our, um, our mission, I guess, as a company in that we've spent a lot of time getting everyone, it doesn't take very much to get everyone on board when you're talking about that sort of thing internally. Um, but externally, um, it's been a funny one because there isn't an immediate commercial benefit to us doing this. It's just the right thing to do. And I think that shifted us generally as a company from being all about growth for growth's sake and actually trying to do the right thing. And I think if we can grow um, while being a sustainable company and helping clients buy sustainable media um, and in the process share the data so that other people can do the same I think that's a good thing so that, that that's our sort of mission now that's a very long answer <laughs> no no it's a great answer and the, funnily enough the last interview I did only a week ago which I don't know if it's been published yet um, was a there was a guy who was actually helping his clients understand um, their, uh, their their carbon footprint really and and helping them overcome that as well. So that might be worth a watch for you as well. Once I've yeah, published that, I'll, I'll shoot you the link anyway, Matt. So so what would you say your main challenges are going forward with 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 all of the changes that you've actually decided that you want to start putting in place? Um, I think on a a micro level, I think the office um, balance of office office time and and working from home time. It's going to be a challenge. Um, we are, as you can probably see, I'm in a very empty office at the moment, and there are three people upstairs. But for a company of, of 30 odd, um, we want more people here um, because I think we miss something by not spending time. The humans miss something by not spending time together. And, and I think you can have a conversation that will eliminate four days of emails just, just by talking over the, over the desk. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of anxiety from a lot of people about coming back to the office, and I, I don't think anyone really needs to be here five days a week. We're looking at the balance between two or three days a week at home and in the office and um, trying to keep it fluid, but also making the office suitable for the new world. So we need to have space in a part of the office that where we can do video calls um, in a sort of acoustic setting so it's not too loud for everybody else. and because um, people are on Zoom a lot more and, and I think they will be for a, for a good foreseeable future. Um, and I guess we just have to, to balance the increased productivity we've seen from people working from home um, because they just get to focus on what they're doing and they just plow out work like you wouldn't believe. Um, but knowing that they're gonna, we're gonna ask people to return to the office two or three days a week, we do expect to see a re reduction in productivity, but I think trying to work out the challenge of the benefit of, the benefit of having people around other people, is that, that, that seems to be the, the challenge. I think I'm not explaining it very well, but I think that's- No, no, the, I get it, I get that's, it. That's, that's the main challenge we're, we're sort of facing at the moment. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, the digital world is, Ever changing, and there are all sorts of challenges out there. And and um, Apple and 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 um, Google are, are removing cookies and device IDs, which makes it difficult for some people to to do what they do. We don't rely on any of those. We 
rely on anonymized data sets and 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 indexing um but i think in the what the the digital landscape is changing and privacy is changing and, and i think for, for the better like we it's been too much of a sort of wild west for for a long while um i think people are getting far more control of, of their data and i think we're gonna move to a place where we are rather than targeting people we are going to be placing ads where people are more likely to see them and that, that will be relevant for them at that at that time without being a bit too sort of really targeted like you've just looked at some uh, you know a duvet cover at don lewis and here are a duvet covers from don elman and all you know like we, it's just a bit weird when that sort of stuff happens so um i think more anonymized brand targeting will be a good thing for the industry um it's and, and subtle, subtle approach right <laughs> yeah subtle but also agencies clients have been really used to seeing very very specific results for those campaigns and and clicks and, and viewability and i think we just need to change the story a bit and start thinking of it more like tv for example or radio where there's an opportunity to see rather than they have definitely seen this and they have clicked on it and um yeah i don't know when the last time you clicked on a on an ad was but um not many people do click on ads and and it's a really poor way to measure the the brand effect of digital advertising so that, that that's a sort of more general challenge we're going to face um, interesting within. so changes in the digital side and also the people side working yeah. out the sort of the hybrid situation and getting the productivity balanced against the uh the way that people interact within the office as well so as uh, brilliant answers so so i suppose the final two questions are always the same in all these interviews if your ideal customer is actually watching this right now matt what sort of role would they have within their organization what sort of organization would it be and what type of industry would they work in um we work with anybody that sells anything really whether whether that's um ideas or products or it, online or in in you know on the high street um We've got a really, really broad range of clients um, from um, small gaming companies to universities who are looking at uh, recruiting new students to um, international car brands to you know, KFC, McDonald's. Um, there, there's a huge range of, um, of brands we work with. And the sorts of people we like talking to um, are obviously in the marketing team and branding teams. Um, and I would just say, if you if you want to understand your audience, if you're not entirely sure about who your audience is, um, or you have an idea and maybe you want some verification of that or some some, some data to back it up, um, then give us a shout and we're happy to, to talk about that. That may or may not turn into a brief, but I think it's that's what we like doing, talking to people about their their brands and trying to understand the challenges. And I think often we'll get briefed from a from an agency and we go back to them and say, what is the client's actual ask what not what are they not what do they want from digital on mobile what do they actually want from the campaign um and that way we can kind of tailor what we're doing and understand the audience a bit more and say i know you've given us this audience to target for digital but actually by doing that you can miss out this whole other crossover audience that that, that may be may lead to incremental growth for you um so yeah anyone anyone in marketing teams brand teams um Give us a shout and be be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Good stuff. Um, are we talking agency side or client side here, by the way? Uh, both. We tend to do 99% um, of what we do through media agencies, um, but some clients don't have an agency or um, maybe use them for planning, but may, might do the buying themselves. So um, have a conversation with us. And if we already work with the agency, we can then talk to them together and, and make sure that everyone's happy with the relationship um but yeah good fantastic so uh, final question is how can they best reach you matt what's the best way to get in contact um find find me on linkedin or go to um, our website which is mobster.com so that's m-o-b-s-t-a.com um there's a contact form there that you can fill in um or like like say uh, find me on linkedin and um and yeah we'll, we'll love love to have a chat with you <laughs> good stuff it's been a pleasure as always, Matt. Thank you so much. And yeah, catch up soon. Cheers. Thanks, Phil. Take care. Bye. Bye.